Welcome to another episode of Show and Tell. My name is Ana Lorena Fabrega, and this is David Perel. And today we're going to be talking about modern making. Full disclosure, I wanted to call this episode the word processing revolution, and David was the geekiest thing I've ever the said. The word and processing revolution was the worst. <laughs> I, I, I it how was to pick the my worst ad, name. So. It was Mom, like. It, it was like what you saw on the cover of Time Magazine in 1994. <laughs> well, anyway, we're going for modern making, okay? So today we're going to be talking about creative uses of technology that help us learn and produce content. Um, David, let's start with the most important thing, show and tell. What is your item for today? Real quick, say your name. Ana Lorena Fabrega. It has like so much flow. It's like if you had a name, Ana Lorena Fabrega has like that. That's like that's <laughs> like you, right? Exactly, Ana Lorena. Well, here's the thing. In my family, we're three Anas. My sister's called Ana Gabriela. My mom is called Ana Rosa. I know, very original. So we have to use our, our middle names. Mine is Ana Lorena. Ah, I remember I made that mistake, and you were like, "Nope, Ana Lorena." Okay, so that's this. It. This is called Inspiration. Okay, this is my show and tell item. And so this was my very first introduction into, into how to develop ideas by like drawing them out. So this was a software tool. And unfortunately, it was for people who couldn't write. And so they gave this to me, but then I actually did better with it. So look on the back, like you can see it's sort of like playful. And so they have like, so uh -huh. like you basically you draw out your ideas. And so this was like, I think my first introduction into, see what you would do is you would draw things with symbols and images, and then it would create an outline for you automatically. And back in the heyday, I mean, this was made in probably 2004. This was like, this was a big deal. Like it says, for example, 640 by 480 display which is now like, two, yeah, 2005, which is now like less than high definition, way less. And this was like really cool. Look, here it says inspiration for Palm OS. Like that's way gone. Oh. So this was like the first computer program I ever used to actually make ideas. And it was called Inspiration. Oh, very cool. Very cool. I like that. Well, I brought something more basic, but my explanation kind of makes up for my item. My show and tell item for today, since we're talking about modern making, is actually a computer. I wanted to get a Mac, but I'm using my Mac, so here. And the reason why I brought a computer is because nowadays, any kid with access to a personal computer has a portable movie studio, because think about programs like iMovie, where kids can just create their trailers and their movies. They have a portable art atelier with all these programs to draw and to design, like you don't need to be a designer, you can just use the programs that come with the computer. You have a fully equipped music creation studio like GarageBand that helps you produce, you know, your own music and, re and records. You can have like a writer's grotto, a printing press, a practice room, a recording studio, anything you want with access to a computer. The reason why I'm talking about this is because we're talking about modern making and kids with access to a computer nowadays can just manipulate the words and images in ways that they couldn't before. And computers and other digital tools just allow any of us to share knowledge creatively. And I'm just obsessed with this idea that, you know, modern technology has lowered the barriers for amateur content creators and producers. And I have a really good example that I shared a few weeks ago um, on social media. Have you heard, David, of this documentary called Searching for Sugar Man? No. No. Okay. So it's a 2012 documentary that tells the story of this like famous um, artist called Rodriguez. He was a singer from Detroit. And he never really gained fame in America, but he somehow became like really popular and like a legend in South Africa. It's a really cool documentary. I recommend watching it. But the reason why I'm bringing it up is because the director of this documentary, he's called Malaik Banjul, Banjul, I think you pronounce his last name. And when he started the documentary, he started, he wanted to get like this like 70s retro feel and vibe. So he started shooting the documentary with like a Super 8 film, right? And halfway through the film, the production actually ran out of money and he could no longer afford this very pricey 8, um, eight film, right? So in desperation, what he did was, he ended up using an iPhone app that's called, I think it's called like 8mm. 
and it cost $1.99. And he ended up shooting the rest of the film using this. And the film ended up, you know, going ahead to win the Academy Award for Best Documentary what? among other awards. So I think this is incredible that a documentary that was partly shot with an iPhone was able to, you know, win the Academy Award. And it's this idea, like, you know, what can we learn from this? That we don't need expensive hardware in order to create. And we don't need, like, all this fancy technology in order to share our stories, right? Like a phone can turn anyone into a filmmaker, like you did with Malik, right? Or a keyboard can talk, turn anyone into a writer. A microphone can turn anyone into a podcaster. And anyone with access to an internet connection can now reach an infinitely large audience. And to me, this is what modern making is, right? It's a superpower. And now it's a matter of helping kids leverage this mm -hmm. superpower and make the most out of it. So it's this idea that we're all producers and it's now time to make the best out of it. And before we continue, I want to share another example that actually you can talk about it. But I've heard that you're a big fan of Casey Neistat. Is that I love right? Casey Neistat. I know. I oh my it. goodness. So Be careful what you mother. wish for. Well, I just love that he, he has his, you know, that's another inspiring story of how he, you know, he's a YouTube filmmaker, right? And he turned upside down the worlds of journalism and advertising and TV and storytelling using the camera that we have in our pockets. So I, you know, maybe you want to talk about this, but it's just another example of how all the things that we can do with all this technology and digital tools in the lever you know in the age of leverage mm -hmm. oh i love casey neistat so casey neistat is one of the people who really inspired me to start creating and being somebody who is prolific and makes stuff all the time and i think that there's a couple things that are really interesting about casey neistat first it's his story before we get into his style so he ran away from home in high school and had a really tough childhood and he grew up pretty poor and yeah he basically just ran away from home where he said all right bye and in high school then he had a kid so he wasn't married and 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 a kid ended up you know he ended up being a dad at like 16 years old so he's not wow. living at home has a kid moves to new york city works as a dishwasher and lives in an apartment the size of a computer screen with him and his kid and from there, just living in New York City, which is not an easy place to live, then works his way up to being one of the most prolific and famous YouTubers in the world. But I think that what he did that was so interesting was he came up with an idea of rather than having the camera point out, you have it point at yourself. And what's really interesting is he started doing that in like 2005. So... And even like 2007, 2008, like there's a really good video of him waiting for the first ever iPhone where he's doing some of these selfie shots. And that was 2007. And it was too early. It was just too early. So he had been doing this. And then he got signed with HBO for a show called The Neistat Brothers with him and his brother. And the show ended up being canceled after one season. It was like a big failure for him. And what I really admire about him is he was able to take the same tools that everybody else had. I had a camera, you had a camera, and said, what if instead of facing it outward, we face it inwards? And I think that there's always opportunities to invent things that are very simple. Like we always think about, oh, in order to invent things, I need to learn rocket science. I need to start some new crazy company. But I'm always reminded that we put a man on the moon before we put wheels on suitcases. And so what are the wheels on suitcases that example. exist right now? Absolutely. And you know what? I just thought of that that video that you sent me yesterday of that teenage boy. That the TikTok, the TikTok one? Talk. So good. Yeah, what's his name? Did you I have no idea, name? but it was so okay. creative. Tell well, a story. We need, to put the link, we need to put the link in this YouTube show because it, I think it speaks to this too and this idea of, you know, all the places you can get to just by doing something really creative and knowing how to market yourself and, and, and publish yourself and put yourself out there, right? And this idea of how, you know, technology has, allows you to share your content, but also to like self-publish, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, well, 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 so basically what this was, so is this guy and he's sort of just standing there and then all of a sudden he pulls out, he takes his hand and sort of throws it up, but then he animates it so it looks like he has a lightsaber, 
And then what he does is he changes and tells the story of him like smashing through the screen. Then he becomes Spider-Man and he's got these spider webs and he's like, pew, pew. and he's, I don't know, probably doing this just at his house, just on some afternoon. And it's so creative. In 20 seconds, he jumps between five, six different Disney Marvel characters. But then I don't know if you saw this because I always say the internet allows you to attract people who you'd never uh, otherwise be able to meet. And the CEO Disney. of Disney, Bob Iger, responded to him directly. I know. He said, please help me publish this. Hopefully we'll get to, you know, a shout out from Disney or something like that. And it happened in less than 12 hours. I thought that was incredible. And that, it, you know, it's a great example for what we're talking about today, right? Wait, have, I, have I told you my TikTok theory of culture? No, but please go ahead. Oh, God. Okay. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so <laughs> so basically, in the 1960s or so, what happened was, like, if you look at the number of people, let's go to 1950s, the number of people at the beginning of the decade who had a television, and the number of people who had a television at the end, huge difference. And, like, in mm. right after World War II, people didn't have TVs, right? World War II was a war that you read about. The Vietnam War was a war that you watched on television. So between... In that 20-year period, a little bit less, something transformative happened. And what happened was TVs became very cheap, and all of a sudden, people started to get them, started to get them. And what I see with my parents and with a lot of boomers is they grew up with this idea that you could consume something from anywhere in the world, and that the war, the Vietnam War, the reason why there were such bad protests against it, at least one of them, was that the war was brought into people's living rooms and there were times where things were just too graphic and they were just like, wow, like that really influences our experience of what it, of how we think about war. Because before we had seen them in newspapers and it didn't have that emotional tenor that just punches mm -hmm. you in the gut. And so mm -hmm. we had an entire generation of people who consumed things globally, consumed video globally. But... Until recently, we didn't have the same aspect of production, where it wasn't natural for people to grow up knowing that they could produce things for the entire world. And I think that that changed with TikTok. I think that what TikTok did, because also you have to know about the algorithm of TikTok. Most social media platforms are based on who you follow. So on Instagram, somebody follows you. On Twitter, somebody follows you, but there's some potential for virality. There's some potential for virality on YouTube, but it still has a lot to do with how many subscribers you have and stuff like that. TikTok, the follow mechanism is very low. So the algorithmic feed takes over and on your very first post, it pops. That's how they've designed the algorithm. So now I was playing golf in December in Florida. And I was playing with a high school English teacher. And we we're on the 16th hole. It was about 7.15 at night. There were these two girls, 9 and 11 years old. They were running around in tie-dye shirts. I was like, what are these girls doing? And he was the English teacher. And he said, they're making TikTok videos. And it hit me in that moment that just like the Vietnam War gave people the sense that you could consume something from everywhere, now we're getting that with production. And so it leads into this modern making where – we're not even encouraging people to become global makers. It's happening naturally in how mm -hmm. we're raising a generation with these new tools and technologies. Mm, I like that. And you call that the TikTok theory. Yeah, I guess. And I like that, you know, and, and, and it's that same idea, you know, that just made me think of how also like with, you know, the same idea is happening, like how, modern making is also transforming the record business and you know independent artists now are devouring the recorded music industry and i love how they call them like the diy artists so like the you know do it your your own or your way artists and of course one of the examples i'm going to bring up is but bunny right um who are just taking you know, it's just incredible don't how bad bunny you don't, don't you love bad so, bunny I, I, I do. I love his music. I don't like that he curses a lot, but I do love the vibe of his songs. I love what he's created Sing and one. how he's just united so many people in Puerto Rico. I think he is sing incredible. One. But anyway, huh? No, sing I'm not going to sing one. Hey, I'm telling you, <laughs> the, the words that he uses are not appropriate. So absolutely not. But I'm just talking about like the vibe. And anyway, 
Um, he's an example of artists who, you know, write their music and control their own music and their distribution in platforms like YouTube, right? So a lot of his success and, and there are other artists like this, it's mostly his own. So he started like posting music on SoundCloud around I think it was 2016. And he was like singing and rapping only in Spanish, like this Puerto Rican songs. And he now has billions of streams on platforms like YouTube and Spotify and a Grammy nomination for a record of the year. And he started, he was, you know, one of the guys who would in the supermarket put like the the food in, in the in the bags and give them to you. Like that was his job. So he came from like a very, very, you know, poor background. And he ended up, you know, now look where he is. And it was all through this you know, self-publishing and, and doing it his own way and producing his own things, which I just think it's incredible. Yeah, when we were in high school, we had this guy who went to my school. His name was G. Jones. And he used to play for, for all of us because I went to this high school and every morning, everyone in the school got together and we watched someone do a public speech. So you could be a presenter and you would speak to the entire school. It's like 350 people. And there's this guy named Greg Jones who would he would play his music, electronic music. It was like very sort of hard electronic music, almost like even like Metallica-y in a sense, but then it also had like these beautiful sort of like synth waves and then like big bass. It was like extreme music, especially for like, hey, it's eight o'clock in the morning at high school. And now he played and we were all like, you know, it's just this guy, he was really into it. And now he is, he headlines it at, He's headlined at music festivals that I've been to, G. Jones, and plays, is like very close with Bass Nectar, who's like a big name in the electronic music scene. And it's really cool just watching people go from that high school hobby to actually being somebody. And all these people, or many of these people who do it, they, they, they have these internet hobbies where they just sort of do it in their bedrooms when they're just hanging out. And all of a sudden it blows up into something. Absolutely. I, it's just, it's incredible how all these digital tools are transforming because I'm not going to use the word revolutionize anymore. So many processes, right? So like you can now like publish your own books. Like actually let's talk about that. Like how digital tools have like transformed the writing process. And one of the things that I think about is if you talk to kids, they'll probably tell you that they dislike writing. And I, I actually don't think that they dislike writing. I think that they just dislike writing in the context of schooling with all, you know, the parameters that school gives you, they make you do it this certain way about topics you don't care about, you know, audiences that you'll never meet. And it's just, you know, there's nothing motivating about writing in that sense, right? So when you talk to them, they're like, yeah, I don't like writing, but they love storytelling. They love telling stories. And one thing that has happened with all these digital tools is that now kids have so many ways to share their stories with the world. And, you know, they can make videos, they can now use cameras and cell phones and voice recorders to share those stories that they have in their heads. And there is no reason why the writing process, you know, why, why kids shouldn't be writing better these days. Because in order to be able to publish all those stories, there has to be some sort of writing before, right? And it's a matter of helping them associate the writing with something fun, you know, something that's going to let them to, to be able to put those stories out there in fun and creative ways. Um, and I was talking to a, a former student about two weeks ago. For, she's 10 years. No, she's actually 11 years old now or 10. I'm not sure. And she was just sharing with me, you know, we were catching up and she was so frustrated, so frustrated because she had to do this presentation. She's doing her kind of like virtual learning. I um, mean, her school is very traditional. And she was asked to present, you know, about on this topic. And she had to choose between a PowerPoint presentation or a five paragraph essay. Those were her two options. And I was like, I share this. Neither. Like, why? Right. I'm, Neither. I'm like, okay. Why are we forcing kids to, 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 you know, we're limiting their creativity by giving them those two options. Like, again, we are in living in a world where we have all these digital tools and all these opportunities to be creative in fun ways, in ways that resonate more with you. And we're still forcing kids to make PowerPoints and to make five paragraph essays. Like it just blows my mind, right? No wonder kids don't like writing. But if we start associating writing like you do, you do an awesome job with Rite of Passage with your online writing school of, you know, changing paradigms and, and thinking about writing in a modern way and in a way that appeals. Like I was surprised your course started this week, we have so many people from all over the world who want to join a writing course. And it's because you've made writing fun, right? With incorporating all these modern techniques and you've made writing 
you know, valuable and adults can see that. And I would love for kids to be able to get that same feeling. And for that, we need to change that perspective using the digital tools that we can use nowadays. Yeah, I was lots of good points there. I was in New York one time and I had a friend named Neil who he was an Irish guy and he lived in New York for like one year and we spent a lot of time together and he he had so many friends just in weird places and this was this was the sister of one of his friends who he was doing some consulting work for and there's a brother and so it's this 13 year old kid and I was like yeah you know what do you do like what are you in New York for he's like oh I'm auditioning for Broadway I'm like oh cool me too you know he's just Okay, interesting. And so I start talking to him and he's like, yeah, well, I also paint. I have my own business selling art. And then I'm also a contributor at the New York Times and I write one of their teenage columns. And I was like, wait, hold on. So you (laughs) act on Broadway, you paint, you have your own business and you write for the New York Times. He's like, yeah, sure. Of course, he, he, he like didn't resonate with him at all that he did all those things. And I, in reflection, I think that what has happened that has been really interesting is all of the tools have gotten so good that once you learn how to use tools, you realize that GarageBand can actually help you make music. I use concepts to do my drawing and concepts helps me draw better. Then I use Hemingway and Grammarly to write, and they both help me write better. And so rather than I'm a writer, I'm a painter, I'm a musician, which is the older categories of things, now that everything is fairly easy to use and very accessible, what people really are is like, what is your perspective? And so Mm. he was all into this idea of hyper-realism, of what does it look like to magnify reality in such a way that you switch it up and you make it look sort of absurd. And so he would take a photo, but then he'd make the sky yellow. Or I have a friend, her name is Alora, and I had some of her art in my room in Brooklyn. And she's this French painter who creates these very sort of magical scapes, mostly of like from photos of Japan, but then she layers on these like really light blues and sort of like sunset colors with like the violet purples and the magentas and the pinks. And her stuff is just absolutely beautiful. And she's also like 23 where she is doing these things and the tools don't really limit her. It's actually Mm. like her own imagination that limits her because it's gotten so much easier. Yeah, I love what you said, like age at this point, it's not a barrier anymore, right? Like kids, like, for example, I've I've, I've been impressed with kids like making all this animation videos, like before you had to actually go to this like professional studio and hire someone and they were the only ones who were able to do all these things. Like now kids are making their own animation. So I think that we're going to have a generation of like producers, uh, like a very young generation of producers, if they learn how to use these tools effectively. Because one of the things that I've been hearing from parents is like, well, if I, you know, just let my kid use a computer, they're just going to be consuming, consuming, consuming. I'm like, well, maybe they haven't discovered the power of using a computer in order to produce things. And I think that one of the big things is like, the way that people are doing, and I want to call it remote learning, because I don't consider that what's going on right now, you know, in most schools around the world with quarantine and everything. That's not online learning. That's remote learning. They're just trying to, like, you know, recreate classrooms in a virtual Good environment. Um, and I think that that's just the wrong way to use technology. Like, if we really want to use technology for kids to learn, we need to use it so that they are learning about, you know, exploring the things that they're curious about. So use technology to explore, use technology to create things. And that's going to look very different depending on the kid and their interests. You know, if they want to create music, if they want to create videos, whatever it is they want to do, designs. Um, they should be using the internet to share that creative output, you know, put those ideas into the world. And they should be using technology to connect with other people and to socialize for me those four things lead to deep learning and but that's not really what schools are using technology for and that just kind of leads me to also um thinking about how not only can kids produce things but they can also edit and customize their work to make it attractive and and i feel like 
that is something that we can help kids do, right? Like they're producing lots of things and they are posting things. The problem is that now we have like 3,000 kitten videos on YouTube and slime videos on YouTube. So obviously with this, it's so easy to, to publish things that sometimes the quality, well, it's going a bit down. So I'm really interested in helping kids produce things that are high quality and things that have the potential to, you know, be out there and for people to want them and for it to become like a real thing, right? Um, and I think that now that editing is something that's continuous and it's not, you know, it used to be like really arduous and, and intermittent and, and like a whole thing. Now it's really easy to edit your own work. Like I'm learning how to edit our videos. I'm learning how to design our things. Like you can do all these things. And I do feel like kids need a bit of help in order to polish the skills, but they're able to do a lot of the learning um, on their own by creating and trying things out and seeing what works and, oh, this doesn't work. I need to look for a YouTube video to learn how to edit my videos. And that whole process is so valuable. I feel like there's so much learning in this kind of like trial and error experiences with digital tools. Okay, my brain is exploding with ideas. Okay, <laughs> literally exploding <laughs> with ideas. Hold on. Okay, so, okay, here's the thing. Okay, so a couple things. So okay. I'm going to talk, remind me, because I'm going to forget. I'm going to talk about software. Then I'm going to talk about documentaries. And then I'm going to talk about college okay. equipment costs. Okay, remember that. Oh, my goodness. Okay. You made so many good points. So uh, the first thing with software, one of the things that's really interesting with software is that the new cutting edge software, it's actually training you to use the software as you use it. So it used to be that you would open something up and you would have to go read a manual and you'd have to watch YouTube videos. Now, if you pay attention to really good pieces, they will actually sort of direct you and show you how to do things. And if you click on a button, they will say, oh, you should have used the keyboard shortcut for that. You'll see keyboard shortcuts are beginning to be displayed everywhere. And what's happening is there's this recursive reflexive feedback loop between the software and the user to make the user good. First thing. Done. Wow. Second thing, our friend Tiago Forte, who is my business partner, he just made a documentary about his dad and he did it all by himself. So he took his iPhone and interviewed his dad, got a very simple lapel mic and made the entire documentary. And Incredible. what he did was he watched pretty cheap courses on Masterclass for Inspiration then he went on YouTube to learn certain skills that you would need in order to do that. Mm -hmm. Then he would watch a lot of documentaries on Netflix because they're so accessible now. I mean, I remember we mm -hmm. used to have to go to the video store to just get a video, come home, then watch it. Then we'd have to go return it. We, You know me, I'm not great with details sometimes. So there'd be late fees, <laughs> all these sorts of things. Netflix, not a problem at all. Mm -hmm. And so Tiago just did this about his dad. Second thing down, third thing to go. And college. in college, thank you. What was really interesting was there were these huge fees that you would get when you took out equipment. So I was doing college television. And I always say, on a, I had the best college communications education, just the best oh, for wow. 1995. It was 21 <laughs> years behind. I mean, it I was, was like, made sound right here. <laughs> for another world that just doesn't exist. And it was really interesting because I did college television at the very high level with teleprompters and professional cameras and high-end Zoom and all these crazy lights. And then when I would go and I would rent out equipment, the fees were insane. I mean, like what I was holding in my hands was thousands of dollars. And if I returned it late, $80 fee. And for a college kid, that was a huge deal. And now when that we make this YouTube video, open up Skype, get some very simple equipment, get it going, and you just don't need all of those things anymore. Incredible, incredible. And well, that made me think about one more thing. I'm gonna share an example. Um, are you familiar with the Hole in the Wall project? No. No, okay, so it's similar to, remember that I shared, I think a few show and tells ago, the. The experiment that they did, the one yeah. laptop per child that they did in Ethiopia. Okay, so somebody pointed out to this other one, and I was like, oh, this is such a great example as well. So in 1999, um, a computer was sunk into the opening of this like wall in an area, in a really poor area in New Delhi, in India. And the screen was visible to like from the street and to anyone who walked by, right? Anyone could use it. And it had 
access to the internet and we have like a number of programs, but it did not have any instructions. So similar to the one of um, the experiment done in Ethiopia, but this was done in 1999, okay? The, the Ethiopia experiment was done in 2012. So the moment that they put the, the, the computer there, a bunch of kids from like this, you know, area, this really poor area came running and they started to click and explore. They obviously had never seen a computer before. They hadn't been through any kind of schooling and they were illiterate. And after a few hours, they started surfing the web. And again, one computer, a bunch of kids. And certain common observations happened because then they duplicated this experiment in other parts of India and they saw the same kind of results, right? So what happened was that one kid did an accidental discovery. And look, and I want you to think of like how, how they're learning and how this learning looks very different from the learning that's teacher directed in school, okay? Here, there's no adults, only the kids. So one kid would start playing around because they would have to take turns and would make an accidental discovery. And then this kid would start to, like other kids would start to repeat that same discovery in the, and, and kind of like discover other things in the process and make other discoveries. And they would start to actually create a vocabulary to describe what they were doing. And their vocabulary is very different from the terms that we use today when we're using a computer, but they would coin their own terms. Then that vocabulary would encourage them to actually start, um, to start to like perceive like different generalizations, such as like, oh, when you click on the hand, you know how there's like a shaped cursor and it starts to go like round, like the hourglass shape mm -hmm. for a while, and then like a new page would come up. So they would start to make these generalizations and communicate it to the other kids. And then they would start to memorize the procedures for doing things. And then when another kid would have a turn, they would practice what the other kid had discovered. They would discover something else. And then when they would find shortcuts, to do something faster, they would teach it to the others. Mm. And one thing that they saw is that kids naturally have this intuition to share and to teach others what they're learning. So no teacher, and they were all learning how to use a computer. And it did get to a point where um, like, there were no further discoveries, right? And at this point, intervention is required. And here, I love, I'm going to pause really quickly, because this is also an example of how a teacher maybe it's not, you know, doesn't have to intervene as much, but at one point the teacher's role is really crucial, which is when the kids are no longer making any new discoveries, you kind of like pop in and you, you know, point something out so that they can continue making discoveries. So the way it would look here is that suddenly like somebody crossing the street, an adult would approach and say, oh, did you know that you can play music with computers? And they would show them and walk away. And then suddenly they were like, okay, a new cycle would begin of new discoveries and new discoveries. And it got to the point where, you know, such minimal interventions from adults make them, you know, discover all this, these things. And they were all, like, the kids just seemed to learn how to use a computer without any assistance. And one of the things they realized that when working in groups, like, kids don't need to be taught how to use a computer. Like, they can teach themselves. And this ability seems to just be, regardless of any educational background that they have, or any literacy level, or any social economic status, or ethnicity, like, they just have this intuition to know how to use technology and to start playing around with it. And they were able to figure out how to work a computer without a teacher. So to me, this is an example of all the things that kids can learn on their own um, with the technology, right? And then having adults kind of like to provide that access and to guide when new discoveries need to be made and to kind of like provide those resources and that space to explore. And I just loved that example. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. The essence of the word processing revolution. Thank you so much. Can we totally change the name for this episode? Forget word, modern making. Word processing. Wait, before we end, can we talk about our FaceTime the other day? What does that have to do with modern making, David? What does that have to do with modern making? <laughs> it doesn't okay, at all, but I need to just tell. Okay. Okay. So you are deadly scared of cockroaches and this you had you had told me this and I didn't realize how bad it was <laughs> so we were facetiming having a good time as usual I think you were making a fruit salad that looked delicious by the way oh Thank you. oh my I did goodness not it, by the way oh my goodness and you had a cockroach where on your foot crawling on my foot it was it was such a traumatizing experience. David, I blacked out. I don't even remember when we hung up. So maybe you want to tell the story because I don't remember. You it. screamed at the top of your lungs. Went like, ah! You said, David, I need to go. I need to go right now. You hung up and that was the end of it. I thought you died. No, seriously. If, I, if there are any former students of mine watching this video, which I know some of them do because they 
comment on my videos, they are probably laughing right now because we had so many, so many episodes in my room, in my classroom with cockroaches and me losing my mind. Anyway, they can actually, if you're listening, you can go ahead and comment some of those stories in this video. Terrifying. I don't know why we brought this up. It's about modern making. So let's wrap this up. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this is a great chat, David. I loved it. Modern making, creative uses of technology. And you know what? Before we finish, I hope that, you know, parents that are home right now and figuring out like, well, what can my kids do? We talked about different programs here that they can explore. And remember that just by exploring and learning how to use these programs, they're actually learning and they can use it to produce those wonderful ideas that they're already having. Totally. I couldn't have said it any better myself. So we'll talk next. Show and tell. Show and tell. Show and tell. I'm excited for a new logo too. 